This Sam Levisi, like, not super exciting. Kind of like a stepping stone to build up to these these other guys. Kind of get, gets you to know Palmazano a little bit, where he's, what his background is, because he's going to be a big guy coming up. And it's always interesting to hear just just the what the government went through to bust something that we just don't even see as anything to even bother with right. nowadays. It's it's just kind of amazing to me, like the steps they went to to bring this guy down, and for what for a thousand dollar fine? Yeah, Sam Labrizzi, the book, <laughs> the book, Sam the book Labrizzi. He ends up passing away young. He's only 50 years old. In 1970, his funeral is handled by the Guadalabene Funeral Home, of course. At the time of his death, he operated Libby's Cocktail Lounge, which actually still existed up until a couple of years ago, which was, oh, on, really? which was on near the corner of like Van Buren and, uh, and Brady. The newspaper said that he was one of the first men ever in the country to be arrested for federal gambling violations. I don't know if that's exactly true. That seems maybe overstating it. Definitely was on the front end because these gambling laws really only went into effect around 61, 62. So him going and getting arrested in 62, this actually, he was one of the earlier guys. I don't know if he's like one of the first. His funeral was well attended. Several known mob guys were there, including Steve DeSalvo, Frank Balistrieri, Tommy Mackey, August Pomizano. Frank Sansone, who was a gambler that did not get killed, Walter Broca, Joey Nea, Peter Balistrieri, and many others. Definitely, you know, he knew all the right guys. And kind of probably was the one that really probably pulled the mafia into gambling, maybe, even? Well, no. Well, they were into gambling, gambling. But he's like the first, like, really big bookie. A lot of these other guys that are going to be known kind of came out from him. him they knew him they worked for him he was probably one of the first really big, big ones prior to this it was more or less you're a guy who knows a bunch of guys that gamble through you where this guy was probably doing it on a much bigger grander scale when it all comes down to it yeah i think this is about this time is when things were like switching with how they were done. Prior to this, there were a lot of gambling games that came out of like people's houses. We've talked in the past about people having like craps games in their house. Mm. Or if they were really, really well set up, they might have the telegraph wire that comes in and gives them race results or sporting results or whatever. I think this is kind of coincides with the time where everybody's kind of using the telephone. You can call into your bookie. So he's like one of the first big bookies that's like, that could, get, getting the phone calls. calls. Yeah, he could be literally sitting in an office and just answering phone calls and taking his his bets. Yeah, and which, people from all over really could be placing bets through him, right? Because and of that, the younger the younger audience here that listens, because I know we have a lot of young, long young fans, they're gonna be like, "Why couldn't people use the telephone before?" <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is a whole other thing. This is about the time where people were really getting access to phones because phones were very weird. And now you have a phone line that runs to your house. Well, you don't anymore because you, you got a cell phone. But, but yeah. if you want, if you want a landline, you get a line that runs to your house, and you can put a phone anywhere you want in your house. Back then, every single telephone, the actual physical telephone, was owned by the phone company and had its own designated number. So you had to actually purchase the phone from the phone company. So it was like a big deal to have a phone. phone. And on top of that, most people didn't have a designated phone number. You shared your phone number with a couple other people on your block. So when the phone rang, you'd have to listen to make sure it was your tone uh, to know that oh, it was... Oh, really? Free. There was actually a tone? Yeah. Usually it would be like for... It would be like three houses side by side. And it would either go ring, ring... Or ring, ring, ring. You know, it would be like slightly different. Do you know which one was yours? And was this when like I got a phone call? Mm -hmm. it, it was this like in the era of like the party line? That's, where, that's exactly what. This where is. your neighbor could pick up their phone then and listen to you talking yeah. to the other person. That's exactly what this, this is. is. Okay, which is which is why I'm saying like calling a, a, a bookie on the phone and making like a bet. You could do it up to this point. Any of your neighbors are, could listen in and, and hear you making the bet. 
Right. So this might not be the kind of information you want to talk about over the phone. <laughs> As we're moving along to where the fewer people have party lines and more people have a designated line, it increases this availability for bookies to take bets over the phone. Now that you say that, now you think about it, this is why this this is probably a huge part of the reason why gambling became such a focal point at this point in time because everybody that was doing it could do it at such a greater scale now mm-hmm. because the technology allowed them to and it stopped being it started being more of a where you could do it as a legit almost like a legitimate business rather than like more of a handshake backdoor type thing right which is interesting. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Like I said, I'm not a gambler. I obviously didn't grow up in this time period. This is what I see as like how things are shifting, mm-hmm. um, based on like you said the available technology and just whatever. So bookie, the way that we, if if anybody has an image of a bookie, I do. Maybe other people don't have an <laughs> image of a bookie, but the way I picture a bookie, this is like really when that starts being what we picture it as. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy who sits by the phone or or maybe in the back corner of a restaurant or something. Right. This is when that guy really kind of gets going. Gotcha. Okay, and there was one other thing you mentioned about that I wanted to touch back on a little bit. And that's, you mentioned in there at one point in time that Frank Balistrieri came out with a, a new rule that you had to kick back like 33% or something of your earnings to him. Yeah. Prior to this... How was the mob making money off of these guys if they weren't taking a cut of their... I think they were taking a cut. I don't know if if the cut just increased or if they were being more serious about it, like actually trying to crack down on it. I don't know. But again, this might be, this might be again, that technology shifting. If there's a crap game or a poker game or something, if the mob's aware of it, they got a guy sitting in on the game. They take a piece of the game when they go. Mm-hmm. This kind of is like more decentralized because now, you know, the bookie can be anywhere. Right. So maybe, and I never really thought about this, but maybe that's kind of the thing. Maybe like this is like why he's putting his foot down so hard at this point because now there is less oversight on these guys because they can be more independent operators. And maybe it just got to the point where he knows Maybe they were all c- kicking him back money. Yeah. But he knows that, no, you're bi- what you're doing is growing exponentially. And what you're kicking back to me is not even close yeah. to what I should be getting from all of this. Yeah. And so he put his foot down and said, this is the percentage that needs to come back to me. And if it's not, we're going to do something about yeah. it. And that could, you, you ask some great questions. <laughs> uh, you should, no, I seriously, you do. I mean, you always do, but I think, <laughs> but I think today, today you really did because I'm, I'm relying so heavily on newspapers and FBI reports that things that aren't reported, I don't generally think that much about it. Yeah. <laughs> you're, but but you're coming in at a different angle, like where you're like, well, why is it this way? And, mm-hmm. I, and I'm so glad that you ask that because I don't know that my answers are right, but you're, at least you're getting me to think about it. Right. And we should be very clear to everybody that when I ask those questions, a lot of what we're saying is just purely speculation, right. looking at the scenario and trying to figure out why would it be doing this way. But right. yeah. No, so. I think I think they're great. That's it's always good to kind of think about things from a different angle. And like, and especially like th- this episode in particular, I mean, maybe people disagree, but I think the gambling stuff is so dry. It like, is. But it's like, but unfortunately it's a necessary part of the story. Like there's going to be gambling episodes. Right. And it, it is dry, but I also find it interesting because I find, I just find how they do, did these things back in the 60s, it doesn't really yeah. matter what it is. Yeah. Like, you could do a podcast about how they made soap back in the 20s, <laughs> and I'd probably find it interesting. Well, let's see, we got to find out why. Or, why, yeah, why, is, or, why soap is Or fake. how they made counterfeit soap, or yeah. whatever the term was for it in the. Yeah. We we'll have a special episode just on fake soap. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> could do that. All right. So, with that, uh, do you got anything else? For this episode? No, not really. Like this is this is the thing. Like he's got this long list of arrests growing up that never really amounted to anything. But by the time the FBI gets on the scene, he's already like the bookie. Like he's the guy. 
the IRS takes him down shortly thereafter. And then he just kind of like sits in the background until he, he passes away, away at the young age of 50. <laughs> 